Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having joined us this evening. Thank you to the Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine for hosting us here, for welcoming me for this residency, and for giving me this opportunity to launch this residency with my distinguished guests here, Richard Sonnet. Richard Sonnet. You know, Marie Ellen mentioned him, and we have John Bingham Hall with us. Uh, I think that many of you uh, know Richard. He's a sociologist and urban planner. He is a specialist in urban development. He's a professor at the London School of Economics at NYU in the U.S. He's published a number of works on questions linked to uh, cities. Uh, he has also founded the Teatro Mundim organization. He is the director, and perhaps John will say a few words about this. Now, let me point out that Richard is a musician. And he's a musician, and that is one of the reasons I wanted him to be here. You know that he is here to deal with these questions of interest. John, too, has a musical background. And uh, could you speak with a microphone, please? Sorry. But he's also an urban planner and researcher. And within the framework of Teatro Mundi, has developed a number of projects in uh, sound urban planning. And uh, he is planning some of these for uh, the UK, but also in France. You know, this is something which was created in London, but I think it's becoming more and more French. Perhaps in terms of an introduction, I could also ask John if he could perhaps say a few words about Théâtre Mundi and the reason that we wanted to work together on this project, because you know that Théâtre Mundi is going to cooperate with this residency, and it is one of the closing elements that will take place in March, the closing events of this uh, residency. John? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. I think that we're going to be speaking uh, for English uh, this evening. I wanted to start in French, because during the uh, various uh, discussions that will take place afterwards, you know, after the presentations by Eric and Richard, all of the contributions, all uh, contributions can take place in either French or in English because you know that uh, uh, in any case, uh, it's just to say that uh, I understand both and that, in fact, as Eric has already said, Teatro Mundi is initially an English structure. We've developed an association in France to develop projects in France and in Europe, and we're used to working in other languages as well. So for everything that's difficult and complex, um, I will speak and, in uh, English. Yeah, I wanted to initially just thank Eric very much for inviting us to be in this incredible um, space. I've been to the other part of the city, but I hadn't actually really been to this bit. It's such a kind of like uh, enlivening space to talk in and be in. Um, but to say a word about where we met and how this kind of came about, um, I mean, Teatro Mundi was founded 10 years ago by Richard to bring together artists uh, from across a broad spectrum, but particularly the performing arts with urbanists to really think together about how how public life in cities is staged, how it's choreographed, how it's composed, how it's narrated. Um, and um, that's been going on for kind of 10 years as of next year, actually. But particularly since 2016, uh, Richard and I started working together in Paris um, at the Fondation Maison des Sciences de l'Homme. And we brought together a group of musicians uh, and architects, really, and, and not people from the university, people practicing in architecture, people performing music, people writing music, to come together.
come together and really just start an open-ended conversation about how uh, they can learn from one another. Uh, we called that Atelier TM, Atelier Teatro Mundi, and um, that was uh, really the beginning of all sorts of projects that started to come to life in Paris. Um, a incredible performance project uh, led by an opera director called Alexandra Lacroix, who I think is going to be joining us uh, at some point. I think she's on her way. Uh, at Chapelle Charbon, uh, amazing, what a kind of major new park being developed in the north of Paris, following its transformation, recording the voices of its inhabitants and, and kind of transforming the space through sound over time. Uh, exchanges with Beirut, uh, with sound artists there, um, but particularly a series of conferences uh, called Sonic Urbanism, um, of which Eric, uh, in which Eric contributed, um, and leading to this series of books, um, Crafting a Sonic Urbanism, which really aim to kind of stake out a new field that's not just about the sound of the city, but that's also about how musical thinking how kind of counterpoint, how polyphony, all these kinds of ideas coming from music can also challenge some of the assumptions we have, give us new frameworks for describing urban life, urban social life. Um, we've also been working, for example, on, on graphic scores and how they could bring new modes of representation into architecture. So for me, this idea of kind of sonic urbanism is really about, yeah, kind of bridging the, the knowledge systems of these different worlds of music and and architecture, and I think uh, that's what we're going to try and do tonight around the idea of polyphony and really start um, with what that means musically. And then I think uh, there'll be a conversation between Richard and Eric, and then I'm going to try and also open that out into some kind of uh, contemporary urban social issues in Paris and how we might actually use, um, which is the city I now live in, the city we've been working in as Teatro Mundi a lot in different ways, um, but also with you all, who probably know the city much better uh, than either of us, um, to yeah, con connect those ideas of, of poly polyphony and what that means uh, socially and, and musically to, to kind of contemporary urbanism in Paris. So um, I'll hand back over to Richard and Eric and I'll be quiet for a while. <laughs> merci, merci à tous deux. Um, thank you to both of you. So I think you've understood the idea of the Polyphonic Museum and the reflection on sound in the museum. So you can see that this is placed in a much broader framework to think of sound in the city as well and to come back to the museum after having taken that detour with regards to the city. And perhaps the museum is a kind of mind microcosm of the urban framework and the issues raised by urban planning. And this is why we are interested in this question. And this is why I wanted to establish the link with these broader urban issues. So, I would like to make a, an introduction, perhaps more than an introduction, but I will try to be a bit brief here so as to give the floor to my guest speakers. But perhaps just a few words about the actual title of this conference, which is uh, Polyphonic Cities. I'd like to come to the two and talk about the two terms. First of all, polyphonics because you know that all of the cycle of conferences and events during my residency will be called mu polyphonic music. Now, polyphonic, because recently you probably heard about the discussions that have taken place at ICOM, which is the International Council of Museums, which in fact has debated at length a new definition of what a museum is. The definition is not yet final. Finalized. It will continue to be discussed perhaps in a more serene way than at the last Kyoto Congress where things were quite tense. So a definition was then proposed and I would like to perhaps look at uh, an extract here of this. Uh, 
And here, part of the ICOM members had suggested this definition, and let me quote it, museums are places of inclusive and polyphonic democratization dedicated to critical dialogue on the past and future. So this whole idea of polyphonics has, uh, in fact, questioned me. Why did they refer to a musical sound term in a world which is usually exclusively visual, the world of museums. So what do we want to say with this term? Is it simply of saying that there are multiple voices in the museum, or are we speaking of something else? This is what led me to think about this term, polyphonics. And this is what has led me to try to understand our relationship to sound, to our sound environment on a daily basis, whether it be interior or exterior, with our ears or all of the different types of prostheses that we use today to create our sound environment. I think a lot of people spend their time to speak with ear, earbuds in their ears. Now, if we start off in a rather schoolish manner, and so we have polyphony here, you know that the dictionary uh, states the following basic definition an assembly of voices or instruments which does not prejudice their nature. Now, we could think of more complex ramifications with regards to the definition. There's the idea that there are several parts. These parts maintain their independence of equal importance and that there are operating rules, if you like, between these different parts and more specifically the rules of counterpoint. So this is essentially what uh, uh, we speak of in terms of West music. And then I'll come back to a discussion, a debate that took place in the 14th century when we look at the evolution of religious music. The character, this polyphonic characteristic can be found in other musical forms and in other uh, continents. Uh, for example, we can uh, refer to the work that was done by Sima Arom, an ethnomusicologist from Central, who studied Central Africa and pygmy music, where we speak of uh, this uh, polyphony and heterorhythmics. So we speak of that independence. We speak of the diversity and this mixture that uh, we find. And starting with that, we know that we have these elements which start to define polyphonics. I'm sure Richard will come back to this and perhaps and give you a more fine-tuned definition. But uh, here, maybe, in terms of an introduction, I could give you, I could uh, divert here to two points. First of all, the question of why do we speak of music in the museum? Why not? And then there's the idea of applying a musical concept, that of polyphonics, to a broader framework. And so at what point in time did we think of this idea, this concept of polyphonics in a broader sense? And this could help us start the discussion. You know that the museum and sound the museum, perhaps, where it's not always as silent as we consider it. If we look at the etymology of the word, the museum, uh, which dates back to Alexandria, and the uh, th and 300 years before our era, was a place dedicated to a collection, of course, where you had a lot of this discussion and exchange. In the Middle Ages, this led to the cabinet of curiosities, where you had objects which were brought together, and they dealt with all of the senses. You could see, uh, touch, smell, or even listen to the objects on exhibit. This was a kind. This was part of the whole Renaissance culture, and what we call the wunderkammer, the cabinet of curiosities. We might think that at the end.
of the 17th century and during the 18th century. In fact, perhaps it was a bit noisy when you went to the museums. Here in this uh, painting, you see the uh, large gallery of the Louvre Museum. You see people chatting and talking, so it's not all that silent. Then this was linked to a more uh, a greater divide between the different arts, the uh, sacredness of the uh, museum. And this is what the 19th century museum will look like. If you look at Schinkel and the Altas Museum in Berlin, and this model will continue through the 20th century, right up to the model of the White Cube Gallery in London, which is dedicated to a kind of uh, devotion of visual arts. Now, at the same time, we can note that art has evolved. I don't want to give you a lecture in art history, but all of this to remind you that the 20th century avant-garde saw the artists themselves more and more interested in the question of sound in a uh, noisy way with the Intonarumori of Luigi Russolo in a more conceptual fashion with Marcel Duchamp's uh, Brie Secret, which is hidden noises. And you see that on the left-hand side of the screen where Marcel Duchamp, where Marcel Duchamp, before closing the box, had put an object in it. So here you have an evocation of sound. And we can talk about the performances, this, the shows put on by the Russian avant-garde. You have, in fact, uh, Malevich's uh, Victory of the Sun. In the 1950s, you had the happenings with uh, uh, John Page, for example. You had Box with the Sound of Its Own Making by Robert Morris. You had a sound piece by uh, Rauschenberg called Oracle. You have Jean Tingli with the meta uh, musical machines. And you have these experimental works that come into museum. These a category of art which is called sound art, but which is going to obtain its rightful place in the museum with Robin Minow in Berlin, or maybe a, a work by Janet Cardiff which refers us back to polyphony, in fact, because this is a Renaissance motet, which was, uh, in fact, uh, e um, broadcast through these loudspeakers, in fact. And this, uh, this uh, piece of art, in fact, sings as well, it would appear. So we saw a number of musical sound objects appearing in museums, in exhibits as well. Let me mention just a few here. We can talk about uh, exhibits on sound art, which are, if you like, a reference point in uh, museum history. It started in the 70s, 80s, continued in the years 2000. In most of the uh, major museums uh, and the uh, subjects which were truly musical, here are a few examples in which I myself participated. So, in fact, I worked on the relationship that a painter can have with music, like Paul Klee, and this was at the Musée de la Musique, a great uh, pop icon and popular culture, David Bowie at the Victoria and Albert, which was also uh, shown in Paris, and then also a work of an artist, of a composer, seen from the angle of plastic arts, which was in fact an exhibit I organized at Hotel Beethoven. 
So all of this, in fact, adapts to the sound dimension in venues which were not destined to host sound. And so this did lead uh, to a number of problems for museums in their attempt to welcome sound in these spaces. We'll come back to the museum afterwards. We'll come back to the issue of polyphonics. Now, when we talk about polyphonics, in fact, we are uh, trying to have it slide towards other areas, other fields. And this idea of interoperability of the concept is something we can do because there's been an evolution in the concept itself in the history of music. And here maybe I can uh, go back in time to the 14th century when this polyphony in fact, really met its climax when it became truly complex as well. And at the time, there was a true discussion within the church because it is within the church that the discussion took place. And I think this is a period, in fact, that the musicologists know very well. It was the famous quarrel between Ars Antiqua and Ars Nova. Today, we tend to say it's simply a quarrel between the ancient and the modern, but there was also a liturgical issue here, a question of the legibility, the intelligibility of a music, because at the time we had a plain chant, and you know, Gregorian chant was the underlying foundation of the music, but here we would add voices, but these voices would always remain in tune with the music, would follow the music. And so there's this idea that privileges understanding and the purity of the uh, chant. In, and then we also saw in the 12th century uh, uh, an, evol an evolution in the notation, the writing, with a new type of musical writing, which is going to uh, further that, complex, uh, that complexity of the music. Now it's clear I'm not going to read this very long uh, extract from a decree uh, from Pope John XXII in 1320, uh, a decree in which he uh, criticizes this new trend, this new museum, which multiplies the rhythms, the uh, brief, the short notes, uh, the echoes between voices, the motes, the fact that uh, the vernacular language was added to the use of Latin in the songs as well. All of this, in fact, uh, was uh, taking away from the comprehension and intelligibility of, this, of the music. But in addition to that, there was the whole aesthetic pleasure uh, derived from this ornamentation. So the rejection of this new trend was also a rejection of a, concept, of a new conception of musical writing. In the ancient musical writing, the sign was a symbol and it was uh, linked by essence to what it referred to. It was referring to the order of the world, a divine order, and so the musical note had a meta metaphysical weight. But in this new approach, you had a nominalist approach in reference to the debate underway at the time in the universities, be it in Paris or Oxford, where the words of language became signs, pure elements of reference, which had been written of their symbolism. What is true for the word is also true for the note, the written note. Another thinker of the times, Jean Demure, who had in fact written uh, Noticia Artis Musicae, had said that the signs were uh, not conventional. While being conventional, we could invent other signs that could be used. Uh, and could be, these signs could be used for other purposes. So there was the portability of the concept and the sign, which was separated from its symbolic function, and it could generate other uses as well, including in uh, calculating proportions, space, uh, 
Now, the link between sound and space already existed, of course. Musicians were familiar with it. And uh, thinkers like Leonardo da Vinci, for example, uh, were interested in this sound architecture concept. But here, the idea of using a common sign for space and music was only possible thanks to this transferability. To quote an example, in 1436, there was the inauguration of the Duomo in Florence uh, by, you know, with its Brunelleschi uh, dome. And in fact, Guillaume Dufay, who was the composer at the time, a Franco French Flemish uh, composer, was asked to write a work specifically for the occasion called Nuper Rosarium Flores. And uh, we'll talk about this in our discussion. So, all of this, in fact, is based on a series of very precise proportions which take into account the different lengths and sections of the work. And very often it was thought that. That, this, that these proportions these uh, were similar to the uh, new cathedral, which had similar proportions. But no, following a discussion between uh, musicologists and other, th other thinkers, it was indicated that this was, in fact, proportions taken from a passage of the Bible describing the Temple of Solomon. And we also uh, have the opposite occurring, that is to say you have musical proportions which are going to govern structure, in fact. For example, a more a, a later work of the 17th century by René Ouva, which is called Architecture Harmonique, or a application of the doctrine of proportions, musical proportions to architecture. Here, they're going to show that the proportions in the Architectura di Vitruva could be, uh, in fact, brought back to harmonic and musical ratios. Then more recently, if we look at the complex collaboration between Le Corbusier and Yanis Zenakis, we see that the mathematical thinking of Yanis Zenakis uh, in works such as Metastasis, where he calls upon divinatory uh, principles and the probabilistic thought is going to be used, in fact, for elaborating the interior and exterior of the convent of La Tourette or the Phillips Pavilion of Expo 58. So these proportions and rules of polyphonics are a kind of building game which are going to serve a certain type of architecture. It's a kind of frozen music to refer to Goethe's concept on architecture, but it is, if you like, locked up in the timelessness, and it doesn't really uh, it does no, it no longer speaks of the listener's perspective perception you need to know that since then in the uh, 60s 70s 80s we are asking ourselves the same questions as in the 14th century questions linked to perception intelligibility for the visitor it's true in urban planning, in architecture, but in museums as well. And so today we come back once again to a more central uh, place for the individual. This is true in the study of the sound landscape, in terms of the urban planning that John is going to talk about. And finally, it's a question of the sound experience being placed at the center. And this is what I would like us to start our discussion on. Perhaps uh, starting with the idea of polyphonics, but perhaps something which is more perceptive than structural. So maybe I can ask you to react to this. Please forgive me if I speak in French, because my, 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 my French is not very good at all. 
very rich um, presentation. Um, I come at this subject in a slightly uh, different way. Um, I, can I move this? Yeah. Um, and I should say that um, my formation is, uh, I'm a violoncelliste, and uh, I, uh, my formation is as a musician. And throughout my uh, life, I have been interested in uh, the ways in which music proposes not simply a metaphor, but actually a visceral way of understanding what culture is about. That is, that it makes clear a kind of way of approaching culture which is performative, which is based on uh, the notion that culture is basically uh, performative. Usually, uh, when the performativity of culture is invoked, it is in uh, verbal terms, in terms of behaviors which are defined, with words people know how to say, rituals that they know how to repeat, or with people like Judith Butler in terms of social behaviors which can be described in words. This is the Judith Butler who, who writes about uh, uh, gender as a kind of performance. And that's not physical in, in her way of thinking. It's something that is verbal. So for me, I've been much more interested in the kind of nonverbal and sonic and also in terms of dance properties that create uh, a culture. And, that, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so that is the background to where I come to for this. I thought the first thing we might discuss is the relationship between uh, polyphony and counterpoint. Polyphony et contrepoint. Vous direz en français? Okay. Uh, why not? Um, Technically, in performance for a musician, polyphony is, as you say, there are distinctive voices, maybe not always equal, but independent. And that means that the range of polyphony uh, is really a term that extends from the Middle Ages up to... Uh, uh, um, uh, things like the Marteau Saint Maitre of, of uh, Pierre Boulez, in which there are many very different voices happening at the same time. And uh, there is in, it, it's, a, it, it's a palimpsest of sounds that may or may not have a relationship to each other but are happening at once. Wh a way to think about polyphony is that it's a spatial arrangement of sound. Whereas counterpoint is a time relationship of sound. That is, it is a species of polyphony in which the, 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 the unfolding of sounds over time uh, becomes the point of listening to these sounds together. Um, I give you an example of actually explain it to you in, in um, a, a piece by um, uh, by uh, I explain it to you in, in terms of Le Matro Sans Maître. Le Matro Sans Maître, as you know, is a, a transformational piece of 20th century music that Boulez made. It's sometimes Polish. Uh, uh, polyphonic in the sense that things are happening independent of each other and don't depend on each other. This becomes something that is very technical in terms of the way in which people either bow or, 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 or blow through the instruments, that they have no relationship to each other. Whereas that there are other points in 
uh, Le Martre aux 100 mètres, particularly towards the end, where the bowing uh, depends on how people are blowing uh, in the wind instruments. There you have a kind of interaction which begins to spread out the experience of simultaneity into something that has a time dimension to it. And so this relationship is one of space versus time, the way I think you can understand it in the most um, basic way. There is a social dimension, a reflection to this. A lot of times when we use words like diversity, a word I hate, um, or complexity or multiplicity, we are thinking polyphonically. That is, we are thinking about a set of different voices which may not be related at all to one another, you know? but they're happening at the same time. That's the urban space thing in the city. You can have many different things happening at once. But the point at which this becomes political is where diversity acquires a counterpoint, which is the expression of one voice depends on an interaction with another voice. And in my view of this, that means that you then begin developing a time relationship. It's not just that I listen to what you say or who you are, but that my reaction to that gradually takes the form of either imitation, if you think about the Boulez example, or of contestation, uh, take another kind of political example, um, so that what you have is the creation of time out of, of social space. You create, uh, if you like, narrative out of social space. And that to me seems to be the, uh, a kind of f uh, fundamental social uh, reflection of this essential musical experience. Now, I wish this was an idea that I thought of myself. I really do wish that this was blindingly original to me. But it is, in fact, um, a proposition that is embedded in the uh, work of Michel Bakhtin on dialogicalism. That is a dialogical relationship is one in which you have different voices that are relating to each other in time, creating a narrative. That's how you get Dostoevsky for, for Bakhtin. That these voices are relating to each other and the narrative is essentially how they mishear or hear each other. Not how they work together. And that's in very important because a dialogical relationship is not a dialectical relationship. This is a fundamental distinction for Bakhtin, as it should be for, for us. A dialectic works to something where they come together. Uh, in the language of, of the UN, I, I don't want to go into this too much, but that people begin to understand each other. They speak with one voice. Utter nonsense. That, or, or that they, in a fancier version, and a Hegelian notion, that there's a synthesis. There is no synthesis in Bakhtin's idea of the dialogic. There is merely a back and forth, a positioning, and so on. And that, that is you have a process without consummation. And this I would argue, and here I do think I have contributed something in a minor way to, to what he is thinking of, has a musical foundation. If you take a piece, of, I don't know how many of you play an instrument, but if you take a, a relatively simple piece like the, uh, the fugue in C major in the second book of uh, Bach's Preludes and Fugues, 
What you have is a, a, canon, a canon work, uh, you know, one, uh, uh, one more so one little fragment, which is given by one voice and then inverted or repeated or distorted by another. Uh, if you play through that fugue, you don't arrive at anything. There is no point of consummation in it. And it's the genius of, I think, of Bach's fugal writing that were riveted, absolutely riveted by what happens next, even though nothing accumulates. If, if you are able to play this fugue, you'll see exactly what I, what I mean. You're going forward, you're moving in time, but you're not moving towards a goal. And that is the genius of, of counterpoint of a fugal sort, which is that it has a forward thrust without a consummation. And it's the same thing in um, the Stockhausen Zeitmaß. I don't know if you know that piece, uh, written about the same time that Marteau Sommetre was, was written, which has an enormous thrust in it, but it's going nowhere. You know, it's, it's not arriving in anywhere. They contrast, for instance, to something like the Messiaen Quartet for the End of Time, which is something that accumulates, which gives a sense of catharsis through it. Uh, there is no catharsis in Bach. There is no catharsis in Messiaen. So that, to me, is what is so fundamental uh, about this distinction. And that's why I would say that um, the challenge, again, if you think about this socially, is how to avoid thinking about, about this relationship in time as being consummated as speaking, as having a catharsis, a denouement, how to avoid liberalism in the American sense, where all, everything comes together and people feel good about each other and so on. This is a nonsense. This is a political nonsense and it's bad politics because it means you sacrifice a lot of difference for the sake of having this kind of catharsis. So the last thing I want, to, I'm sorry to go I'm so long about this, I've been thinking about this for decades, so it's something in my head, is um, uh, the school that I come out of is, as, as you may know, is a pragmatic school of philosophy. And the key word for us uh, as pragmatists is experience. Experience in, Fr in French. In both English and French, uh, that word experience is too fuzzy. We need to actually refer to German to understand that uh, experiences which, which, uh, which um, relate to this distinction between polyphonie and contrepoint, or polyphonie and counterpoint. In German, you can speak about uh, experience in two ways, as Erlebnis or Erfahrung. And Erlebnis is an, ex is an experience which is sensate in itself. It is like polyphony. Many senses are activated at the same time. Uh, they may not be equal, but they are they're, they're independent. Whereas Erfahrung is about something uh, that it's about experience which has a shape. And uh, as, for instance, the idea of Erfahrung in, in um, Jürgen Habermas uses it, that shape is gradually a consonance that you give a form to experience in time, which comes together with other people. Uh, and that's true in Heidegger as, as well. But for other 
ways of thinking about this in um, German, that experience is pushed forward in time. It has an Erfahrung, has a shape, but it's like that Bach canon uh, in, in that little fugue, that you don't know where it's going. It's an open-ended process. Uh, it has uh, a form in time without a consummation in time. And that, to me, is as I understand it, the good politics of experience. Not, I must say, polyphony, which I think is um, too, too, um, uh, too squishy politically, too, too loose. But, uh, but counterpoint in this form of elebness, which is something where you are reacting to other voices without expecting a consummation. So that's where I am. In maybe we have a debate about about, <laughs> about this, but that's that's how I conceive this distinction between uh, counterpoint and um, uh, and polyphony. Well, c'est très intéressant parce que c'est vrai qu'on a. That's very interesting because uh, it's true that uh, we tend to think of counterpoint as, as merely. Uh, rules game game of rules you know like a dictionary that are applied by composer it's just like harmony uh, rules that are never respected but here we are uh, in front of two different conceptions of of the multiplicity if I could use a neutral term not to say diversity <laughs> never is uh, Mr. Senate so do you think that these two meanings are opposed, like um, if they were not, they could not get together, or is there a, a, a possible graduation? Are there things in between polyphony and counterpoint? Do you think that music has developed different forms that are to be found in between these two extremes, these two poles? Of course, they're, they're related. Every, everything relates. But to me, Eric, there is the, the, the aesthetic difference between them and also the political difference is maybe what you could call expectation in terms of what you're hearing. I, I'm trying to think of what... I, I don't know much about popular music, so I can't give you any any example from that. Um, when you listen to, have you, any of you heard um, any of the music of Philip Glass? You know what I'm, yeah. His notion is that basically uh, a, there is a tension between um, between polyphony and uh, uh, and counterpoint, which is uh, which works this way. When you hear, take something like the first knee knee, uh, what's it called? The first knee um, play. Einstein. Yeah, and Einstein, Einstein on the beach. beach. That is purely polyf uh, um, a polyphonic. There, there's a set of repetitions that go again and again and again. And then something very weird begins happening to it, which is instead of all this a cappella uh, uh, sound that you're hearing, you're beginning to hear very different voices. They're all singing the same thing over and playing the same thing. Very, it seems very boring. But after about four or five minutes, you're struck by the fact that something is emerging from this, which mm. can't be reduced back to the po uh, uh, polyphony. Mm. You, you are hearing parts that are actually not really together. And what, at least what, the versions of it I've played in, uh, the conductor will begin uh, differentiating. So after maybe 40 or 50 times of hearing the same thing repeated, you're beginning to hear parts 
which are reacting to other parts, but the whole thing is falling apart. <laughs> I mean, the, all of Philip Glass and a lot of serialism true of Steve Reich as well is an undoing of something that is merely in the beginning a set of repeated uh, poly polyphonic sounds. So that you generate, what I'm trying to say about this, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm not saying it well, is that in a way that um, counterpoint, because that's what Philip does in, in all of these pieces, counterpoint is a way of attacking polyphony over time. It's an incredible strategy that you hear something again and again and again, and then you're hearing things that are sort of, it's the same music, but you're hearing it differently. And the whole thing is falling apart. And with these knee plays, you know, uh, they begin to be absolutely kind of disruptive, and then they end. And then he does something else. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I, there, of course, there's a relationship in it, but I think, in, I, and that's why I say probably this might be true in disco, which I, I have to refer to you, but I, I can't listen to it. But um, uh, he has, he's a very, very good musician, but he has degraded taste. So I just <laughs> warn you about this. So, too many nightclubs. Too many. Rots the brain. Many, yeah. Uh, but you understand the point I'm making about this. Uh, counterpoint does something destructive to polyphony. Eric, could I... Um, Sorry, didn't you just No, you're right. I mean, I spent three years studying classical music and I've forgotten everything because I spent the rest of the time since... In clubs. In clubs. Um, but, um, I mean, I, to kind of ground this and concretize it in the city a little bit for those who are not musicians and might be lost in amongst these kind of different... In a way, I had a kind of... Um, a space and an example in mind which actually has so many more resonances than I actually realized with what you're talking about. Um, I mean, <clears throat> we've spent, myself and my colleague Fanny uh, here have spent the week in the neighborhood of Goudor in the north of Paris. We're doing field work for a totally different project about cultural production in cities and, and how to support the kind of hidden spaces where culture is made before it becomes visible. Um, and the kind of, you know, perception of the Goutte d'Or is from, I, be, I mean, I'm kind of characterizing based on not my own experience, but what I've heard a lot of, you know, Parisians saying is that it's kind of chaos. It doesn't, you know, it, it, it's, it's seen as a bit of a ghetto. It's kind of um, seen as quite communitarist, I think, to some degree. Um, and yeah, seen as something, a place that doesn't quite make sense. And it really reminded me of the Pope's kind of criticism of polyphony in the 14th century that you mentioned, this kind of loss of intelligibility. It no longer makes sense. There's too much going on. And I think it really, you know, that kind of authoritarian view of uh, culture, in a sense, that it, it needs to be kind of clearly apprehendable so that it can be controlled to some degree, I think, is so much... Uh, there's been so much of that... Um, from a kind of public, uh, a political point of view towards these kinds of neighborhoods, not just in Paris, but in London and all over the world, that they need cleaning, they need to be, they need to make sense, they need to be attractive in order that the public can kind of access them. In a, and the public, of course, being kind of conceived as white and middle class and having money to spend. But, um, you know, so... There's, there is a kind of huge polyphony going on there, but some of the people we spoke to and been interviewing who run small fabric workshops, couturiers, um, but also people who are kind of doing more modern version, we, someone said to us, well, there are these kind of parallel communities here that don't have a language to talk to one another. And it really reminded me when you, part of your definition, Richard, was about polyphony not just being these things happening alongside one another, but responding voices responding to one another and starting to be able to kind of pick up influences and pick up elements from one another. So one of the people, one of the kind of creators that we spoke to who's trying to kind of use some of the African fabrics and the African um, kind of uh, fashions that are being produced and that's what the neighborhood is, one of the things it's very known for and he's trying to translate those which are part of his own culture into 
uh, things that can speak to a kind of youth, uh, you know, the young artists and creative professionals, etc. So it's the, finding these kind of points where these different voices that are happening and these very parallel lives happening alongside one another can start to kind of retain their independence and not need to become part of this very clean, harmonious whole. Because I think there's a danger in this discussion of polyphony that it got picked up by the wrong people and we, people start to say, yes, of course, cities need to be harmonious, right? Like, you know, and, and I don't think a neighborhood like the Good Door can ever be harmonious, but it can be polyphonic in a way that goes beyond this kind of coexistence of just different things happening without any relationship. It can um, start to have these touch points where things respond, connect, and, and speak to one another. Um, and there is, uh, I'm, I'm, you said you've been thinking about this stuff for decades, Richard, as you said. I'm, this is pretty new stuff this week, and I've got another colleague in the audience uh, who knows the neighborhood a huge amount better than me and probably will have something to say about the, these issues, uh, which is Miriam Shabani. Um, but um, one of the, there's an interesting project in the neighborhood where some of the kind of couturiers um, are a part of a collective um, and they, they're not kind of drawn into kind of one you know, monolithic like company or organization, but they form part of a collective and they federate certain resources. They have a single kind of contact point with clients. It's enabling them to kind of speak more broadly about the skills that are in the neighborhood. They're starting to make clothes now for people like the Opera de Paris, making costumes. But the, these are the kind of, um, these are couturiers who have been in the neighborhood of African origin, like to a great extent, but not exclusively. Um, for, for decades and, and used to be, there used to be a lot more kind of, um, uh, a lot of people working perhaps not fully kind of like documented, regulated. And so they're trying to kind of formalize this, but without kind of controlling it all. And it, part of your definition, Eric, of kind of this independence of voices, but then belonging to a whole, I think it's a very interesting model for kind of all of these very small kind of enterprises are going on. These are kind of individuals with their individual workshops, individual craftspeople, becoming part of something bigger in order to try and speak also and be heard at a kind of city-wide scale and not be written off as this kind of, you know, just undocumented people in this chaotic neighborhood doing messy stuff. You know, to say actually, yes, it's like we don't need to change the space. We don't need to clean it up. We don't need to kind of reorganize the space. And that's a bit the, that issue of experience. Like polyphony, can't, doesn't you can't necessarily experience it as a person walking around that neighborhood, you know? But it was only when we started to speak to people and, and find out how they work that there is actually this kind of like organization of these very, you know, of these multiple things going on that you can't experience, you can't hear, you can't see, you can't touch. So I think there's a, a kind of a real importance in this idea of like, in some of the models that, uh, of, of social life and organization that we could start to actually build on these definitions of polyphony. But there's also a danger in the idea that polyphony should be something tangible, or this harmonious idea of polyphony should be tangible in the city, because that stuff is invisible, and the result of it can still be a kind of very sensorially chaotic environment, but it doesn't mean there aren't really important forms of contact, federation, kind of like collaboration going on between these kind of very different communities and, and activities. And just to kind of, you know, finish that it goes beyond that, you know, we're hearing stories of then kind of how like the new music center is organizing with the African couturiers to organize, you know, a fashion show and then the kind of like you know, the shop that's updating the stars is kind of all, you know, there's lots of these kind of touch points and it does concretize. I think it's important that these kind of forms of, um, uh, yeah, of interaction that come from this kind of um, polyphonic mode of organization do kind of turn into tangible events or tangible, you know, comings together at certain points. But without kind of imposing, uh, I suppose it's, we, can, we might think, going back to the musical thing, we might think it, this is the difference between an orchestra with a conductor playing a kind of pre-composed and harmonious polyphony to a kind of like some form of semi-organized improvisation. 
where it's not just free improvisation, everyone's doing their own thing, but there's, a, as you say, Eric, a set of kind of principles that create moments where this comes together. It might be a temporal set of principles that every 16 bars, we kind of have these moments where that all comes together so we can... Could, could I say just yeah. one thing about that and then we should engage you? Um, what's happened to a lot of conducting practice uh, in, in my generation, the generations after it, has been a kind of research into how uh, uh, subordinate voices are dealt with in the texture of performing. Uh, the generations that came before me of conductors were, um, uh, there was a melody and you know, there was the supporting stuff that gave it a little texture. Uh, but uh, a, a, a Toscanini performance, for instance, is basically laid out as a linear structure in which there is something which dominant and, and supporting. And what came apart in my generation, the younger generations, was the notion of the inner voice being a support for the, uh, um, for the dominant voice. You can hear this, for instance, in the difference between Toscanini's rendition of, uh, that I just was listening to this, the Tchaikovsky Serenade and Pierre Boulez's uh, rendition of the Tchaikovsky Serenade. You listen to Toscanini, it's, it's very linear. It all comes together, everything is balanced and so on. You listen to Pierre Boulez and you think, my God, you know, this is not really uh, tightly made. It's got a structure, but it looks like those inner voices are going to play some other piece of music in about five minutes, you know? And I, I say this because I think that what we've got to get out of our minds is the notion that basically form is something which creates a whole which has is, which is got that kind of structure uh, in which uh, basically hierarchical kinds of structures. And to me, at least in classical music, I mean, the whole, the whole adventure that we've had is how to get rid of hierarchy but keep the form, you know? And you can hear it even, as I say, in listening to Boulez versus Toscanini play, what seems to be the most soppy piece of romantic uh, uh, music. Well, it's very beautiful, but uh, so that, I, I just think there's a, there's a problem in thinking when things come together or they relate to each other, that they relate in, uh, that they relate in ways which create a common kind of thing. It, the relationship is oftentimes the tension. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Attention is a form of relationship. Mm. And working out attention is true in life, too. Let's not go into the psychology of this, <laughs> uh, which we could go into. No, but I think that what's interesting in the discussion, in listening to you both, is that you're both speaking as musicians. And it is as you speak as musicians that you are able to, in fact, highlight those complex aspects here. And we realize that the musicians themselves, even if they interpret the music, even the conductor reading the musical scores, they give us a kind of palette, this graduation in the conception here in terms of the performative aspect of the concept. I think that this opens up very interesting fields of reflection. And I think we've heard uh, John uh, talk about this, and Teatro Mundi does this in the urban context. I think that today's challenge and 
only link with this residency is how do we apply this to the museum? You know, the museum is an urban microcosm, but it also has something which is linked to history. It is a venue for interpretation. The museum is constantly reinterpreting its past. And before we start the discussion with the audience, and before we welcome our friends, with regards to the museum more specifically, how do you envisage the museum and the multiplicity of the polyphonies in the museum? How can it develop? I think that I have a question for you, Eric, in fact. Do you think that the museum can really become polyphonic if it remains, in fact, in a monolithic building? You know that uh, here the museum is, in fact, something which spatially represents a coherent entity with a conductor which manages it. <laughs> I was trying to find the word, maybe uh, it, to be provocative, we could try to envisage a model of the museum which would represent the, uh, the uh, designers of La Goutte d'Or, where in fact you don't have one single space, you have satellites, satellites close to their own public, their customers, their visitors. They have a very close link relationship. The doors are open, you can hear what's happening inside. Can we envisage the museum in this way? If we abandon all of these enormous historical buildings, how can we make these buildings more welcoming? Perhaps this is one of the fundamental uh, questions for all museum directors. You know, that try to make them more welcoming. Uh, but I think we'll still always have difficulties to get people from the neighborhoods to come to the museum. So could we envisage a kind of museum which would be a polyphonic collection of different sites, venues? Can or can the museum actually receive, welcome the, the multiple voices that polyphony? I think that this is a challenge. It's something that we can discuss with the colleagues present here today. You know that uh, I think this is what they are confronted by today. The museum, there are all types of museums. We don't speak of one museum as such. You know, the museums are still perhaps based on the 19th century model, but there are many examples of museums which have evolved with the community, with the environment. I think Nancy Solomon wrote a book called Participatory Museum, and this is a project which was in link, linked to the whole question of co-construction, co-curating, whereby the building looks more outward. Then you have functions which try to assemble, uh, unite, bring together. I think this is something that museums continue to do. And there's the whole issue of the digital as well, how the museum gets out of its walls thanks to digital technology. So I think we need to address all of these different types of configuration. And I think that we can see that many uh, museums have projects outside of their walls. Yes? Are there comments or questions with the microphone, please? 
Uh, Richard, I wanted to say that the museum in London, for example, are becoming, are becoming in fact, venues where they can um, welcome the uh, public with different sonic environments. You know that we are, you know, organizing performances, etc., yoga sessions, etc. Because they're very big spaces with like very echoey acoustics. You go and you have like a DJ playing, you can't hear the beat because it's like echoing so much. Like, it's interesting, you know, it's difficult to really invite these very different forms of sound into the museum sometimes um, that are close to people's kind of, you know, social habits otherwise. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Are there questions or comments in the audience? I'd like to come back to the discussion that you uh, set out, in fact, concerning the definition of the museum defined by the ICOM and which was rejected because the word polyphony uh, led to a debate. That wasn't the only word that created a debate. I wanted to know whether or not the rejection was linked to the political aspect of the word polyphonic, uh, which can be very contemporary. It can mean diversity, but it uh, perhaps can go further back in um, in time where, a, in fact, a, an English woman wrote uh, in fact, a article where she said that polyphonics in the opera, in fact, was a means of teaching uh, the public the polyphonics of society. So there's a political and social aspect to this. Can you perhaps explain the reason for which the word polyphonic was such a problem within the discussions? In the, on the definition of museum. I thought that the discussion that took place with regards to the definition, and you know that this was something that was proposed by the Anglo-Saxon Museum, so there was almost a cultural difference here in the understanding of the theme, but perhaps in terms of the actual role of the museum, what people reproached the definition was that the primary uh, work of the museum, the mission to preserve uh, the art, etc., was not highlighted in the definition proposed. You know, you had the beginning of the definition and then the rest. So I think that it was, in fact, to accompany an evolution, in fact, that all of the museums followed finally, you know, the idea of putting the public at the heart but the uh, stress placed on diversity, on the political dimension, uh, stirred a great deal of debate. Even if on the term polyphony, I must say there was a specific debate on that, sub on that issue, but, you know, it, it appeared to be incongruous, in fact, uh, to use that term. People thought that it was a term taken from elsewhere and that people didn't really understand. But the political, the underlying political dimension, which has been mentioned here, is there, of course, yes. And I think that it does have a, a history as well and probably the a question of opera when the question arises. Thank you. I'm going to ask the question for John and Richards. So I'd like to ask it in English. Polyphony and harmony as sort of potentially um, uh, antagonistic uh, 
uh, concepts, Al although obviously opera ca can be a, a, an example to the opposite, but I was wondering if you had maybe references or narratives that we could, um, you could share with us of harmonious uh, polyphony, but like maybe outside of what would be expected, uh, you know, as a standard form of, of harmony. Um, Musically. I, I really, I, I, I can only answer you this fairly technically about that. Harmony is, a, it's a, a very gross word. Um, there are m uh, many, many forms of harmonies. And in the, in counterpoint, those harmonies sometimes can be, uh, happen at the same time. So you have a, a four-one cadence where all the voices come together to do that, or, as is more um, evident uh, in uh, again in Bach, that the harmony will happen, but not at the same time. That is, that the the uh, a voice that comes in later will resolve something that happens before. I don't like to use just speaking musically about this, I don't like to do, there's a kind of analysis which is associated with a Nazi figure named Schenker, which is about, uh, basically about harmonies that are sliced like this and the tendency of things to, to find a kind of harmonic center. Uh, and I just think it's much, um, for, for us, it's not very useful one of the interesting things about modern harmony is that because it doesn't happen at the same time, it's a thing of memory. So that you're hearing different voices playing and suddenly uh, the memory is constructing a kind of confluence between them. Uh, a lot of canon writing is determined by um, certain kinds of harmonic rules. There's what's called a fourth order uh, of canon writing, which also employs this kind of memory stuff. But I think the distinction that we're making is really one between space and time, not between, um, between consonants, and harmonic um, uh, harmony versus uh, something that has no harmonic relationship to each other. It just, it, it sort of muddies the whole thing about this. And the reason for that is that a lot of the development, uh, at least in Western music, of harmonic evolution uh, doesn't come out of voice writing. It comes somewhere else. If you think in Chopin, for instance, who had an amazing harmonic sense. I mean, they're absolutely stunning what's happening. It's all derived from, in my view, from Bach chorales. That is, almost all of the Chopin etudes, both volumes of them. Uh, if Bach had been alive, he would have said, yeah, that's how I do that, you know. And uh, it, 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 it doesn't come from voice writing. It comes from something else. It, it comes from a uh, notion of stunning, of surprise, of uh, this comfort, which is very important in harmonic writing, because when you're, um, I'm sorry, you've got me really going on this. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, 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 I, mean, I mean, we always think of harmonies as resolving. They don't. And that's why it, I think that it's in somewhere else. Uh, uh, in, the music doesn't provide a, a harmonic stuff to them provide us a maquette for. This is an important distinction between polyphony and counterpoint. I mean, it's important sociologically. And uh, I think it has to be kept at, at, that, at that level. Can I bring us down a level culturally? <laughs> like, I think it's a really interesting question that clearly we're going to have to discuss more and maybe we're developing a project for Teatro Mundi here, but my, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about dance music of gay clubs of Paris um, 
and <laughs> the difference between being somewhere that plays kind of disco or maybe house would be a bit, you know, very related music styles that have um, to, yeah, to try not to fall into the trap you just warned us of, of kind of calling some things harmonious and some things other things not harmonious because like whilst harmony is a kind of technical musical term, there's so much value system around, you know, how these things are framed. But if I think about kind of disco and house that you hear in Rosa Bonheur on a Sunday night, and then I think about like industrial kind of noise that you hear in like La Toilette is a nightclub or like Mess, which is a 24-hour party that happens. Like they both, you know, I enjoy them both. So to me, they're both harmonious to a certain degree, but house and disco have a huge amount of like landmarks within them. You can hear the beginning and the end of a 16 bar pattern or an eight bar pattern. There is a certain like tonal resolution that happens within them as well. The bass will kind of tend to come back to the central like key at the end of that 16 bar pattern. And therefore, but that's great because there's certain kinds of like movement and relationship that happen in those kinds of clubs. It's like you, of course, get things like voguing and working, like dance styles that are built around that and very much about performing identity, performing to one another. They tend to be spaces where people are very much oriented towards one another and it's very sociable because kind of you have this clear shared framework of rhythm and tone that kind of like does conclude every 16 bars in this kind of endlessly repeating <laughs> kind of thing and you, and you can build this movement around it. But then um, in this other completely other sound world of kind of industrial noise that kind of also ha happens in big warehouses or old gymnasiums where the acoustics also mean you lose the beat and it starts to become this like <laughs> like a lot of this but what's interesting you know like it's a different kind of social space you you kind of tend to lose yourself you go into yourself a little bit you're kind of lost in this texture and this soundscape it's a bit less it's kind of less sociable to some degree but it's also for me more transformative um, so, yeah, like, like Richard said, it's not that one is technically harmonious and the other isn't, but certain forms of music just, you know, have a more, wear their structure on the surface much more, and that enables certain kinds of interaction. Mais je pense que aussi ce qui est intéressant pour revenir à cette distinction euh, polyphonie contrepoint, c'est comme vous disiez. You know, when you were talking about the polyphonics, you were speaking of the spatial relation with the uh, time uh, aspect that you have in counterpoint. But, you know, we live with the two dimensions, what you've described here in the different uh, clubs is the different spatial and temporal uh, event. There's a constant link between the two, between polyphony and a counterpoint. This is a tool, a tool that we can in the end use when we want to talk about sound in the museum, sound in the city. In fact, we're always working with these two aspects. This is why there's this antinomy, but at the same time, as you say, they mutually destroy each other, but it's a, still a relation, even if it's a conflictual one. Depuis quand les musées sont-ils de, devenus des lieux silencieux? Since when have museums became, become a places of silence? In the painter's workshop, for example, in the painter's studio, you know, people in the 19th century, well, people would uh, hold, a, hold a session where people would discuss, talk, chat, etc. And perhaps here we need to read the, uh, mu the historians of uh, museums. I think that this is a phenomenon dating back to the 19th century. It is also a phenomenon linked to the opening of museums to all publics, the democratization of museums, which led to a certain type of behavior that was expected. Um, I remember the opening of the Victorian Albert Museum in 1860, in the 1860s, which uh, became open to all publics and was open at night. 
contrary to the British Museum, which was only open two hours a day, and you had to reserve, to make an appointment to go. So the idea of opening to all publics with the need to uh, manage the public's behavior. Yes, we will open the doors to everyone, but you have to behave in a certain way. So there was this induced behavior, and as a result, this led to this attitude we find in museums, this uh, reverential, silent uh, uh, museum. Look at the way people walk in museums. There's a certain way of walking in museums, and this is something that was created little by little. It's not only in the museum where this idea of silence or the, the, this wished idea of silence has become more and more common in these new luxury developments, all these luxury housing. Grief, I think, to like you know, isolate the interior from the exterior, you know, like in increasingly noisy cities, which are increasingly noisy because of transport, because of aviation, because of all sorts of things. Um, like there's a, you know, silence becomes more of a luxury. It becomes kind of like more related to privilege. And so, you know, it, it's interesting kind of talking about and valuing this kind of polyphony, but then also kind of, you know, many of us may be having more access to some to quiet as well and then kind of seeking that that polyphony but um i suppose i think that whilst yeah cities have become much noisier in some ways they've perhaps also become more sonically monocultural and and a lot of the noise we get is kind of a few key sound sources really like tires on on tarmac like airplanes, like there's, there's a certain kind of few key things that really colonize the like airwaves or colonize acoustic space. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I have to attribute here to our colleague Gassia Uzunian, um, who will be here for one of the later sessions as part of Eric's residency, who's worked a huge amount on the changing politics of um, how noise is defined. Um, and, and how those defini definitions of noise have been used to kind of valorize or kind of criticize certain kinds of, of sound within the city and our changing idea of kind of what's good sound and what's bad sound. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of thinking in Paris, the example of like the cafe terraces, the temporary terraces being extended. Um, and yeah, attention and, and kind of a, a conflict with neighbors who are worried about the sounds of people enjoying themselves in the evening <laughs> outside going too late. But whilst we've become, you know, so used to the sound of traffic, the sound of kind of motorbikes, the sound of cars, um, you know, so in a way, I think also, I mean, our most recent conference in the series of <laughs> Crafting a Sonic Urbanism and the third book will be out soon from that was about non-human life and the, the, the sounds of non-human life in the city. Um, and I think we have a kind of dual thing to do about not making cities quieter, but kind of decolonizing the, the, the way that kind of humans and also particular, you know, like particular parts of human society have kind of filled acoustic space so much. That needs to be withdrawn, but not with a view to making cities quieter, with a view to kind of making space for more of a multitude of species, of parts of society to be heard. And I mean that very, very literally. I mean, like, being able to hear one another's voices on the street, being able to have some of those points of interaction and response that Richard talks about that don't necessarily mean it all coming together nicely, but just really being able to hear one another in the city, not being afraid of each other's voices when you're in your apartment, like, you know, not lumping kind of like the sounds of life together with kind of the s certain sounds of certain kinds of noise pollution that have, it's all been kind of put together in a sense. So I think, yeah, we have, a, we have to kind of make, withdraw certain sounds in order to actually make cities kind of perhaps noisier in some ways, but noisier with, a, with the sounds of, of life. It's quite idealistic, but this is my manifesto for... <laughs> Well, I, I, I would say about, uh, uh, maybe we turn, finish, it's late. You've been such a wonderful audience. 
uh, but we need drinks. <laughs> and, you know, how that is. But I would say about the silence, uh, issue of silence, it's a very interesting one in music. Because uh, 18th century audiences were very noisy. They talked while people sang, uh, and they were very interventionist. For instance, if somebody did somebody, uh, some, sang something wonderfully, the audience would shout out, uh, uh, point, point, uh, like, as we would say, peace, peace, do it again. So that you had a very noisy, but also very interactive audience with uh, the stage. And what happens in 19th century music, particularly in the wing of it, which is more Germanic and winds up with Wagner, is that you have to, the audience wants to keep silent in order to be able to have the experience of art. That is, it becomes more submissive because if you miss anything by interfering with yourself, the experience of what you're hearing will be less. So in a way, kind of silence and profundity become mixed in this kind of bourgeois thing. And whereas the, the experience of 18th century audiences must have been, for us, we must have wondered if we could go back to the, are these people really interested in hearing, you know, Don Giovanni, or the magic flute or so on? Because they're eating chicken wings, they're gossiping to their neighbors, they hear a nice high note, and they go, Beast, point, point, you know. That's a very, to us, very superficial way of experiencing art. And I've th I thought a lot about this in terms of what we, I, I want more audience interaction. You know, I don't want people to just sit there and go, oh, so I can't, I can't, I can't move, you know, I can't say anything. But on the other hand, how is that a kind of way of destroying the intensity of an aesthetic experience? And, um, when I was giving concerts, we, we uh, experimented with this a lot. We talked to audiences. Um, sometimes we even stopped playing in the middle and say, this is a big thing that's about to happen, you know, and did it again. Is it a good thing? I don't know. But there is, I think in, in the aesthetic domain, this is a huge shift. Uh, the notion that you really have to surrender in order to have a profound aesthetic ex experience. You, you, it's, a, it's a power thing. So, so uh, yeah, what we're gonna do? You got the last word. And there was one. Yeah, in case you want to Yeah, we should stop. <laughs> Yes, good evening. I would like to just mention two points that you've said. On the one hand, sometimes we have the feeling that, generally speaking, it's uh, the milieu of culture or any uh, cultural action that has to be uh, silent. We have to be, you know, sort of reverence to it. And what you're saying about the 18th century, uh, we can find it, you know, in uh, corridas in both fights where we eat, uh, we drink, uh, and also sports in the arena. There is, uh, you know, this interaction between the public and the game, and where the sound of the public, this contribution, is as important as what happens in the arena. We've seen it with uh, COVID, you know, an empty uh, arena doesn't work the same. You know, it's the shift of attitude. With with the sound of uh, the people in the museums. And I do not share that view of uh, silent museum because you have to introduce the notion of time, really, like in many other places. Uh, very often there is an image of an empty museum and it's uh, very quiet and very silent and everybody is very reverential. But the Louvre, it's not that. Louvre, it's another sound. It's the noise of the people.
people of uh, of uh, people walking. Maybe it's not shouts or people that run. We're not exactly in the street, but th there is a reflection on this uh, sound level with a very high uh, number of people that go and visit uh, the Louvre. And there is a, a moment in the week where you have groups of kids that come and to visit the museum with the school and during the weekend. So there is this notion of sound and time in polyphony, whether well, you can talk about that when you talk about museum. And also at the beginning, when you say that museums are trying to open themselves to, to uh, more diversity. <laughs> But what is part of it is the number of action that are taking place in the museums, the number of activities of actions. You know, we have also uh, groups of uh, children. So there is a whole set of activities within the museum that really counters this uh, very reverential attitude in museum, and that produce very different sounds and uh, that evolve in time. I do agree with you. It's true that there is this uh, sonic dimension, the sound dimension, which is not taken into account. Usually it's not taken into account in the design, in the architectural design of uh, the buildings. And it's true that it exists. The museum is not quiet, it's not silent. There is a sonic dimension that varies according to different parameters, but usually it's not taken into account and it's not used also. And finally, we could use it as a tool. And as you say, you know, there is everything which is the different activities that are going on that really uh, change the uh, sound environment of uh, or landscape of the museum. Don't you think that there is a, a very uh, strong relationship between the museum as a space for sort of a group of socializing and also a place, or rather a time? Aren't we coming from a, a museum which is a space in the 18th or 17th century and then after? It's more the time, the relationship with the works of art, which is different maybe in the 19th century or in the 20th century. We don't look at the works of art with the same eyes. I mean, did we have the same way of looking at things in the 18th century in museums when they were a place of gathering? Yes, well, I think, I think that uh, the uh, ways or the conditions where people were looking at the art were different just like, you know, listening to the opera. We've heard about this, you know, when people had this sort of uh, rattling at, uh, in, 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 in the opera, so they could not have the same uh, visual attention on each of the uh, pieces of arts. And, and there is a dimension that changes, that has evolved today. And I had done, in another conference, I had said that we, we, we had been from white cube to a black box. Museums are becoming theaters because there is a performance, there are different activities. Um, there is uh, the video installations, the different installations that uh, take place there. And, and uh, you know, uh, tanks that the Tate Gallery had opened. It was, uh, you know, performative art. So maybe we're even beyond the white cube, even, even if we see many white cubes that open. So I think that, of course, our gaze, uh, the way we look at things have changed. And I think it's, we can come to an end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you.